How much would it take to plant humanity's seed on another planet? Not only to wither and die, but rather to be self-sufficient and sustained. To create a terraformed planet with a thriving economy, independent of our Earth. I decided to explore this question with the last dark challenge in surviving Mars. Today I'm collaborating with Paradox to undergo this expedition, where you play the entire game with only one rocket ship that delivers 12 humans at the start of your expedition to the Red Planet. Stranded and alone, they face the daunting task of populating an entire world from their limited genetic material. It's the true Adam and Eve challenge. Everyone will eventually be inbred. But if that's what it takes to populate the Red Planet and save the human race, then that's what we're doing. We'll start out our mission with an expedition leader who's a doctor. This will help raise the birth rate, and our colonists will live on Mars with life support from their enclosed domes. They'll need the best childcare and comfort to encourage them to procreate almost constantly. Six men and six women. As for our colonists, we need to pick people who are flawless. Ideally, sexy people, because they have a higher birth rate. Meet our colonists now. After a quick survey of the surface, we landed our rocket containing the drones to prepare the site for habitation by our 12 colonists. The first step on day one is to build a drone hub containing workers and a power generator to secure a foothold for preparing the site for resource extraction from the ground. With a concrete extractor and a stockpile placed, our drones are hauling off the first resources they'll need to construct a dome suitable for the inhabitants. The final step before our founder colonists arrive is to prepare for them a pleasant habitat to encourage them to socialize and procreate, again, almost constantly. Just imagine being sealed in a dome with six men and six women, upon whose coitus the extinction of the human race depends. In a word, thrilling. And so the intergalactic eloping began. In most games of Surviving Mars, people are plentiful. Running out? Simply import a ship full of them from Earth. But since we're limited to only the 12 colonists we began with, the fate of the planet, nay, the fate of the whole human species, rests on the ability of these 12 people to produce as many babies as possible and seed the way for future generations. Fortunately, Four of them have the sexy trait, which means that they will likely be more fertile as long as we provide for them. So after our colonists have arrived on the planet and participated in a series of brief inaugural exercises to encourage team building, we send them to their comfortable homes. They're not that comfortable, but they're good enough. We build a diner and an electronic store to make our residents yet even more comfortable, increasing the probability that they will produce yet even more healthy offspring. And it's not long before we accomplish the great feat of producing the first Martian-born human. His name was Jerry Rigel. No one in the colony was named Rigel. Whose child is he? No one knows. But this is how everyone is born in Surviving Mars. We construct a nursery to accommodate him and the other youngsters, and a school in attempts to brainwash him with knowledge, and prevent him from degenerating into an idiot troglodyte. After one full week of acclimating our colonists to the Red Planet, it's beginning to seem to me that we're going to need to focus on specialization. Adults having babies in one dome, children living and learning in another. So I constructed another terrarium and made it accessible through a linking tunnel, insulating our humans from the cold, inhospitable vacuum of the Martian surface. I also constructed a train station for the adults to work in the underground shafts where they unearth metals for usage in our construction developments. Our children are comfortable and well taken care of, so we build more, reaching the milestone of food production. In only a week's time, technology has rapidly aged our two Martian-born colonists, Jerry Rigel and Ace Gale, into strapping youths, prepared to tackle the task of seeding the new world. Meanwhile, three more offspring are born to our original founding Earth-born humans, Curio Starkiller, Vector Dust Devil, and who? Connor. I'm serious, that's his name. However, they are dissimilar to their parents. Flawed nincompoops. One of them is a hypochondriac. One is a whiner. Another is gluttonous. And who, Connor, of all people, grows up to be a sexy idiot? 
None of them are specialists, but all replaceable normies. How am I supposed to work with these people? It was at this point in time, after one month, that the tyrant awoke in me. If my colonists weren't going to work for the greater good of the human race, or weighing and balance the fate of an entire planet, I would force them to enjoy themselves, whether they liked it or not, coercing them into reproduction, more exercise, more meet and greets, food, socializing, the children learned, and under my harsh but watchful eye, we more than doubled our population until Martian-borns outnumbered Earth-borns. Who was the dominant species now? Polymer factories, a few resupply missions from the last dwindling resources on Earth, and the expansion of our domes and infrastructure to support a larger, yet more unproductive and stupid first generation of Martians. With the breakthrough technology of stem cell reconstruction researched, even middle-aged Martians could be fruitful and multiply well into old age. All progressed and increased. Yes, everything seemed hunky-dory until... The crisis materialized. There was first the Great Famine of Day 54, when we licked the floor for sustenance. The Meteor Shower of Day 57, when we were nearly obliterated. And finally, the financial collapse of day 162, when we nearly ran out of money. Until finally, compromises and solutions emerged, like isolating the old people, or slaughtering all the ducks for food. And in the end, we grew. But we lost the lives of our founders as the population stabilized and learned from its first foray into the black unknown of the cosmos. Growth is not without hardship, but it's always darkest before the dawning and we emerged from our cocoon of adversity unbuffeted and prepared for the next evolution of our civilization. The Brain Ray. It was the first wonder of a technology we uncovered which saved the day. Now, instead of dealing with colonists who were lazy, alcoholic whiners, we just beamed personality-altering gamma rays into their noggins, cultivating qualities such as hippie, workaholic, religious, genius, and sexy. But that was only the beginning. We also dug an infinite excavation in the ground, dubbed the Mohole. We built Hawking universities to replace our puny research labs. We constructed a geoscape dome in appreciation of our Mother Earth. And we managed the ultimate feat of raising cows on Mars turning pulp science fiction on its head. Now we were the flying saucer people. Little green aliens be damned. We created a reality TV show studio, and at long last began the terraforming of the planet with the foundational project of 12 greenhouse gas factories, tingling our tongues with a faint, strangely nostalgic hint of global warming, which turns out to be what Mars desperately needs. At long last, we had 100 colonists, and soon very many more to spare. I can't begin to describe to you how truly majestic it feels when you finally get down to the important business of terraforming Mars. Despite the fact that I had spent the last 12 hours sitting in my underwear in a dark room, obsessing over the drama of the lives of fake virtual humans, it was pure magic to finally witness the first acid rain, the completion of breathable atmosphere, and the hue shift in the firmament overhead from a dusty red to a clear, true blue. Finally, fresh rain fell, and the meteors were burned away before they arrived at the surface by the thick, newly formed atmosphere. We surpassed 1,000 colonists, constructed an open-air capital city, built this thing, created an artificial sun to supply ourselves with energy, and covered the surface with lakes from the voluminous underground water deposits. We sent 12 rocket crews to their deaths so that we could seed the planet, prompting a single spontaneous bush generation on the opposite side of the map. You'd better appreciate that bush. Tens of people died for it. But that's still nothing in comparison with the teary-eyed sense of home you get when you see trees, grass, and lichen spreading over the surface of the planet. By this point in time, even lichen and moss have made their journey across the entire map and erupted in spontaneous generation. A feast of green for the eyes. In an unusual way, almost all the technology becomes redundant, as colonists no longer require the scaffolding of infrastructure to capture their water and air, so it gets used for better things. Power, 
food, fuel, further rapidifying the rate of growth. Now well beyond day 600, I just enjoy looking through my colony and getting an aneurysm as I attempt to process and appreciate all of the hard work that went into this program from our drones and shuttles, who have now taken on the appearance of a biblical swarm of locusts and other vermin, but they're on our side. It was good to be in charge, but now at last, humanity will take over, thrive and multiply without my intervention, and I take a lot of comfort in this. With the final outburst of a sporadic forest opposite our base, I know that my work here is complete, and then it's off to greener fields and pastures new, literally. Once again, a big thank you to Paradox for sponsoring this endeavor. You can go check out the new expansion pack for the Martian Express DLC, which adds trains with the link below. And a major thanks to my patrons, who are almost constantly reproducing. I'm ambiguous amphibian. Until next time.